and this was just like had you ever met this person before was he just a fan of s like what was the situation he was a fan of s i f- i had met him before and he was at our new york show he was at one of the cmj shows you know and he was he was a scientist and he was like he said to us I'm going to regret it for a week if I call into work tomorrow, but I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life if I don't drive my favorite band to their next show. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. You are listening to the Sub Pop Podcast, Episode 8. I am Arwen Nix here with Sub Pop's own Five Feet of Fury. Oh, God. <laughs> Alyssa Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Alyssa. Um, hello. Hi. <laughs> You're so red. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to hear that so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so you just heard from Jen Champion <laughs> of S talking about being on tour. And when they were touring the East Coast recently, last year, they uh, their van broke down. It really did. Yeah. And they had to hitchhike from New York down the East Coast <laughs> while they were waiting, while their drummer stayed in New York, their drummer Zach stayed in New York waiting for the van to get fixed. And they just would go on stage and be like, um, we're us and we need a ride <laughs> and a place to sleep. And their fans took care of them. It was incredible. Yeah. I, Arwen was telling me about this in real time as it was happening. And I, I still couldn't believe it. Yeah, I was what a little frantic. What do you mean? Where are they? <laughs> Who drove them where? It totally worked out. I mean, clearly not as planned. Right. But through the kindness of strangers. Yeah. And friends. And Jen was on tour. So she's with uh, Carrie Murphy, who plays guitar in S. And Stacy Peck was playing bass and keyboards. And Stacy's really good at asking people for things. She's like a very strong, outgoing personality and just really charming. And Jen, I think, is really charming. But she's also much more of an introvert. So for her to get up there and ask for something like was really hard and she kept saying like well like Stacy would just like mention it and be like right Jen we have a problem what's the problem <laughs> and Jen would just have to be like uh we need a ride <laughs> but I'm sure they would want me to say extra thank you to all the fans that helped them out and got them from state to state yes definitely yeah. and Jen we've heard a little bit of previously in the season one of the sub hot podcast yeah, we heard she, her in the trailer she was in the trailer she's been like a secret producer helping us get other people to come on the show like ben from band of horses yes and jen and ben if you'll stay with us here <laughs> we're in chris is weird seminal northwest band yes that was mentioned in ben's piece and is going to be mentioned today again today later in this piece but before we get to that Alyssa, i have a question for you about yeah, jen about jen. jen champion all right let's answer it maybe so Jen told me that the first time <laughs> she met you was at a party and that you, she didn't know it was you. Why didn't she know it was you, Alyssa? Well, we hadn't met before, really. And I might have been wearing a gorilla costume. <laughs> and I might have refused to take off the gorilla mask. You might have been smoking through the nostril of the gorilla mask <laughs> while sitting outside. Well, well all right. And Since flirting with Jen. Since my height was mentioned, this, <laughs> this gorilla costume would have better fit like a six foot three man, <laughs> which made it perfect for me because the only thing funnier than a gorilla costume is a loose fitting gorilla costume, loose fur, <laughs> baggy fur. I just imagine the arms of this like flopping yeah. around. Yeah. So of course I'm not going to take off the mask and introduce myself, but I did really enjoy talking to Jen <laughs> and a lifelong friendship was born. It's true. That yes. is true. Um, I didn't remember that until it was recently brought to my, r- reminded to me. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that gorilla costume. I really miss that thing. We're going to have to get you another gorilla costume. I think, yes. I mean, if maybe if we ever do like a podcast, like live episode. That would probably be the only way I would do a podcast <laughs> live episode. <laughs> you can remain having some anonymity. I don't I don't smoke anymore, but I would like sip my water through a straw through the nostril. <laughs> oh, <crap. laughs> anyway, sorry, Jen. Yes. So that's uh, that is how I first met Jen. And 
She, and I, I think it's worth mentioning too, um, S is on Hardly Art, and it's S, just the letter S. Just the letter S. The most ungoogleable band, which, I think we called it. Yes, which is why she made t-shirts with her face that just say ungoogleable. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it's, yeah, not ESS or anything like nope, that. It's just S. Just S. Just S. And you should ask her what it stands for. She loves that. Oh, well, she, can you tell <laughs> us what it stands for? It doesn't stand for anything. It's just S. <laughs> It's just the letter S. I don't know how that works. I still don't really believe her. We've been dating for a long time, but S. Jen. <sighs> Jen T. Champion, woman of mystery. Yeah. So, and of still many mysteries to be revealed because when we were talking about this episode, people who know her quite well were very surprised. Including me. I, I, I pulled Jen aside. We live together and I pulled her into my office and was like, okay, we're gonna talk for the Sub Pop podcast. I want you to tell me the story about having to hitchhike after your van breaking down at CMJ. And it was awful. She gave me an awful interview <laughs> and not, it wasn't her fault. It was because I knew the story. And so I'm asking her all these questions and we're both trying to pretend like she hasn't told me this story a bunch <laughs> and she wasn't texting me while it was happening. And I'm trying to like <laughs> feign surprise and it just didn't work out. And so I just kind of like, you know, I, I tried for like 45 minutes to get a good interview. It wasn't working. We went downstairs and it happened to be the night that Lemmy passed away. And I mentioned like, oh, Lemmy died. And she says, I was in a movie with Lemmy once. <laughs> oh <my laughs> it was just like my jaw hit the floor and I was like, back upstairs, champion. <laughs> we are talking about that. How dare you, madam. <laughs> and Get then, back on mic. Yeah. And then even more secrets were revealed to me, which you will now hear. Let me just tell you, this is a movie about some ladies in a rock and roll band. We ran a big house, the four of us. We lived together, we played together. Just think of how tight we get and how quickly. I think the idea sucks. What do you mean? It's perfect. I just moved to Portland. I didn't have a job. And I can't remember how I heard about they were hiring day extras. So one of the new players from L7 was in it. And just like there were rumors that Lemmy was in it. This generation is full of angst and unknown like desires. I like your your advice, but I can't understand the words you're saying. Well, that's your problem, isn't it, Chief? They needed people for this party scene. There was like a big house party in the movie. I think it was actually just me and Ben go. Because no one else was like, that's dumb, I don't want to do that. But it was like 50 bucks. And we just had to like drink, stand in the hallway and like drink fake beer while the actors like ran by saying their lines. And what I didn't know at the time is in the party scene, you have to act like you're partying, but you can't make any noise. So like you have to pretend there's music on and like you're drinking a beer, but it's really like gross water. <laughs> and, like you're having a weird you're just moving your mouth at another person but you're not really saying anything and they had all the sound in later i didn't know that at the time so are you gonna go talk to him i'm afraid he won't remember who i am what have you got to lose right except maybe your virginity <sighs> but anyway in the movie these girls live in this house of course they all live in a house together and they're in a rock and roll band but lemmy lives in the closet <laughs> and gives them advice when they need it does Lemmy play Lemmy? Yeah, Lemmy plays Lemmy. But then they we got asked to come back the next day for the after party scene, which is pretty much all of Carissa's weird standing in this circle. And while well, these two band lady ladies in the band get in this big fight. I do remember when in the actual party scene when we're all partying, fake partying or whatever. One of the characters is like messing around with a football and they decide like in the middle of the party scene, like, like wait, 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 okay, you. And they're pointing at me and they're like, you get down there and like she's going to be throwing the football and it's going to hit you in the face. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, oh, cool. I guess I got a scene in this movie, whatever, <laughs> you know, but you got to do that scene like so many times. <laughs> I was like, Ben is just laughing at me. And they don't want to get the thrown the football at me again. <laughs> and I was kind of like that. I don't think that was worth fifty dollars. 
just while we're on the topic, have you been in any other movies? Um, when I was little, I was in a <laughs> special. <laughs> what? <laughs> For what? Thing, uh, something you might have watched in school about the desert. Things you might not know about the desert. And I'm eight. And my scene is to be perplexed about if the bus is alive or not. Because he says the bus died. And I really didn't sell it. Is the bus alive? He said it died, so it must have been alive. I know it moved and it drank gasoline and it made a noise. I don't understand. How can you tell the difference between what is alive and what isn't? But I really froze up. I really froze up. I really blew my big shot. I just... I remember being so disappointed with myself. I mean, did you get negative feedback? No, but it was one of those things where like, I did not anticipate stage fright. I didn't get, I knew all my lines, but like when it came down to like everyone's filming and it's a bunch of people I don't know, like I was literally felt like I was like reading lines off a page. <laughs> Versus just like saying them. I know that sounds silly for a little kid, but I don't think it does. Do you still get stage fright now? Not not as much. Uh, it's like two different ways. One is if I am surprised by how many people are at a show. Like if I've been backstage for a while and I come out and there's a lot of people at a show, and I like I'm not prepared. For this much attention or if it's like there's three people then I'm like I am not prepared for this much eye contact <laughs> you know it's, it's Did you find those movies? <laughs> so I still have not seen them, only heard them, and now I must see the actual thing. You can find all of Down and Out with the Dolls, the movie that she was in in Portland, uh, on YouTube. It is there. <laughs> and if you can make it through to the scene where Jen gets hit in the face <laughs> with a football, God bless you. Uh, I didn't, but... You didn't? So no, you haven't seen it yet? I haven't watched all of it. Poor Jen. Oh, no, I don't think she'd be mad about it. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, poor Jen getting hit in the face with the football. And then so many times. And sh it's like a millisecond. <laughs> in the background. Yeah, right? so maybe I saw it and I just like missed that part because it was basically nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and then after that, like the she told me that there was someone in Tucson who may or may not have gone on to work with puppets might have had a part of it that so really was as much information as she gave you right? yeah and so then i started emailing all of the people in tucson who call themselves the tucson puppet lady which believe it or not more than one person has that <laughs> title and apparently i was emailing with the wrong tucson puppet lady but they were the the puppet ladies were all very nice about it and then jen asked her mom pam and pam asked someone else and so on and so forth and they ended up burning a copy of this from VHS to DVD and sending it to us. Amazing. Yeah. 
<laughs> and Jen did tell me just like as of yesterday, the only reason I'm letting you play this is because I love you. <laughs> and that translates to, I need you to stop talking about this. <laughs> so there you go. Now everyone's satisfied. Thank you. But I have her seven-year-old voice stuck in my head now. Isn't that the cutest thing you've ever heard? It really is. Thanks, Jen. Thank Thanks, you. puppet ladies. I don't More understand. Also, yes, recording artist, Jen Champion. Oh, yeah. She makes music. It's great. Cool choices. And great videos. Have we talked about that? Oh, she makes great videos. Go watch her dance and get happy about it. Yeah. Because it's really good. She beyonce before Beyonce. She did. <laughs> um... Do we have a Mega Mart ad this week? Oh, Alyssa, we have the ultimate Mega Mart ad this week. We got a uh, email. We did. Yeah, and he, I know you were surprised. <laughs> we were surprised too. Yay! Someone actually wrote to us, and they had questions, and so we set out to answer the questions. All right. Do you remember the name of the gentleman that wrote in? His name is Vern. Vern, that's right. We're not going to answer all of Vern's questions. But we would like to say, Vern, this Mega Mart ad is for you. Yeah. You ready, Stuart? But like a good piece of advice is never solve the problem you're given to solve. Your idea of good advice is different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> can we do this? I could explain more, but we got to get to work. Okay. Hey, Stuart. Uh-huh. <laughs> What is a loser edition? Oh boy. It's a limited edition colored vinyl version of one of our records. So why does Sub Pop make loser editions? To give something cool and maybe sort of collectible to the fans of our artists or fans of Sub Pop. And just because colored vinyl looks cool and how can you tell it's a loser edition? Oh, that is a great question. And I had a whole thing worked out in my head about that already. Great. The loser edition has a, every record we put out pretty much has a sticker on the cover and it either says loser edition and it's gold. It'll say like loser edition, colored vinyl, or it's kind of a silver sticker and it probably just says like download included. Okay. But other than that, there's not a difference if you see in the, in the shops a loser edition and a non-loser edition. Look for the badge. And I'm going to make photographs to put on the, the website about that. Subpop.fm? Subpop.fm. So Stuart, who decides on the color of the records? The artist decides along with, you know, under the constraints of what the pressing plant can actually make. So where can you buy Loser Editions? That's, this is my favorite question. You can buy Loser Editions at the Sub Pop Mega Mart, megamart.subpop.com, or in stores that we sell directly to, which are so probably not Target, but your local record store, very likely buys direct from us or artists can themselves get loser edition copies of their own records so if they're on tour and it's close to maybe when their record has come out you might be in luck so do all records released by sub pop get a loser edition pretty much yes for full length lps that are new records what advice would you give to someone who wants to make sure they get a loser edition? I would say if you are really good friends with your local record store and you know they get loser editions, that's one avenue to go, especially if you have a friend there who can maybe put one aside behind the counter. <laughs> but if you really, really need it, you should order it at megamart.subpop.com. I think this might be the most like advertisey advertisement we've made. Yeah, I mean, it, I've been preparing for like a week. Thanks, Vern, for writing in. If you have questions about what we sell and when we sell it and why we sell it, we can't guarantee that we'll answer your questions, but we'll probably address them. 
Especially since not a lot of people are asking questions. <laughs> <laughs>
And so that, not that like I care about the outside impression so significantly to, you know, force something artificially, but it, it wasn't artificial. It was like, I can't, I just can't do this. And I, and I don't want to change like the history of Dumb and Girls, you know, it's such a distinct thing and it was so fun and so cool and such a learning process. It was like my first real thing I ever did of my own. And, you know, we worked really hard and we made a lot of headway for my, uh, what I thought I was doing when I started, which was putting songs on MySpace, like <laughs> before going to my job or something, you know? Um, so it was like, okay, I definitely think that this is something else. This is totally something else. And, and I started feeling like, you know, I've, I've hit the ceiling yeah. with what I can do in this I mean, that kind of speaks situation. to like, the strength of that project of Dum Dum Girls, that it has like this specific integrity and like you want to pay respect to that. And like, totally. This is what yeah. This which is. is like a funny sort of phrasing of words because, you know, I, I would talk to various people about it every now and again and they'd be like, well, you know, Dum Dum Girls has always been your thing. You can make it whatever you want. And I was like, I, I, yes, I, I acknowledge that. But like, I get so much it, like kickback. Yeah. You know, like it. This would this would be too abrupt, and I don't I don't want to like you said disrespect <laughs> sort of this institution sure. that that I technically like started the snowball rolling off the mountain, but at a certain point like it kind of was on its own. Yeah, it became its own mountain. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was sending demos to my manager and my, you know, sort of like executive producer of many years, Richard Goderer, who's been, you know, such a mentor, such like a New York father figure, um, a critic, but like very supportive and enthusiastic and just a wonderful energy to have around consistently in my career. And he was like, these aren't good. <laughs> oh my God, what did that feel like? Well, I wasn't totally convinced. Like I said, like after having gone to LA and been like, oh cool, I have these like six songs, like let's work on them. And you know, I remember George being like, well, this one's like pretty good. Like these times, yeah, it's like a little lackluster on the chorus. I'm like, oh, okay, shit, okay. Um, so it wasn't, you know, I was aware that because I was really trying to write outside like my box that it wasn't super strong and that I was going to need to put in the time. So that initial like, come on, you can do better than this. I was like, okay, yeah, fair enough. I totally can. Back, you know, another month, another whatever, same reaction. He's like, I know what you can do. Like you can't, like this just doesn't know. <laughs> like, no. And I'm like, wow. oh wow. And it was about that time. It's like time. such an insulting compliment where it's like. Well, yeah, really it talented. wasn't insulting, but it was like, you know, that's what, like, a, that's what I need him there for. Yeah. God, if I had recorded those songs and put out that album, like, what a <laughs> joke. Like, not cool. Worst idea ever. And I think about maybe that same week I went and saw um, Perfume Genius, who I refer to as Perfume Jesus, like, regularly, which I think probably just... Pretty you know, yeah, suggests yeah. like how highly <laughs> <laughs> I revere <laughs> Mike. Um, and uh, this show was mind blowing. Um, and like having been familiar with his previous work and just really, really latching on to his new record and you know how he'd made a pretty significant transition. And like, um, I know he'd he had brought on like one of the guys from Portishead to like supplementally produce and I was just like wow he really sorted his shit out like these songs are incredible the, the record is paced so well every song is like articulated just perfectly like it doesn't have too much crap distracting it like his voice and what he's saying is still the driving force and then there's just so many interesting like song to song different sounds happening and it didn't sound at all like oh 
well now this is his this song it was just like you could hear the little references that as like a music nerd you know like oh like I, I know what he's doing there but like it was <laughs> subtle and it was it was uh like a a tool it wasn't like a dominant you know pastiche sort of thing and and his performance was incredible and like the stage was pretty minimal and he had you know a drummer and maybe like a synth player and then someone going between bass and guitar and then just him and he'd he'd go between you know these very sort of intense performative songs to sitting down at the piano and you know playing really delicate beautiful things and I was like oh like not that I want to do th what he's doing like sonically or whatever stylistically but just how he was doing it how effectively I felt like he was doing it I had like a total moment of clarity where it was like I need to find my this like, yeah. and I saved like the backstage pass and it's on my laptop and I saved my wristband and it's like on my refrigerator oh, and I got so like cute. a little <laughs> weird about it um, and then it became this <laughs> stupid issue of like okay well if we're gonna consider potentially doing it as a solo thing like what are you going to call it? Because if I came up with an entirely new band name, that's even harder to like parlay whatever like history I have into it. So I was like, okay, yeah, sure, Dee Dee. And I was like, well, shit, if that's, if it's that or Dum Dum Girls, I'm going to do that. You know, like I, I will say that. And so I remember I was sitting at this bar in San Diego called The Whistle Stop where I used to uh, go, you know, somewhat regularly when I lived there. My friends had would have a DJ night there, like, I don't know, Fridays or Saturday or something. And I'm catching up with an old friend while I'm in the, the you know, area, the smoking area. I'm on my phone and I emailed Jonathan because Tony, or, you know, my A&R people were starting to kick back a little strongly, like, just really not feeling like this is going to be a smart move like yeah. and if you want to pursue the DD thing we're gonna have to do some preventative legal stuff and your record's gonna be postponed by at least six months and I was like, Jesus, Jesus Christ um, so I'm writing Jonathan who's always been like in my corner and I, I just love him so much and it blows my mind that like he you know regards me in the same way as like <laughs> you know, all the incredible artists. Like, I'm one of his artists, it's totally weird. Um, so I'm writing him sort of like, hey, do you think you could maybe like talk to them? And like, and he wrote back just being like, you know what, I'm starting to kind of feel similarly. And I was like, oh no, that was like the one thing I thought I had in this conversation. So I write back and I'm like, look, you know, if, if it's really gonna be this like make or break situation, I, concede and I will accept Penny and I will try to like spiritually and like get behind it and have it make sense to me and while I'm you know like rudely writing this email but it's like feeling very life or death because mm -hmm. it's like we delivered the music and we have to deliver all the metadata within a week and it's like what is it even being called like how do we not know oh, this yet man. I'm reminiscing with my friend Mario who uh, had a DJ night in San Diego when I first moved there in like 2004 with my uh, at that time future husband Brandon um, called Skull Control after the band. Um, someone once like made a jab you know and referred to me as like Kristen Control like I was a groupie or some whatever the the thing was and I of course in the moment initially I mean immediately was like that's such a good name <laughs> like Kristen Control <laughs> like it looks at that's my punk name you know oh but you know I have a band and a different name. and so I'm just sitting there and we're telling the story and like laughing at all our you know youthful antics shit like that might be a cool thing and and Mario was like yeah dude that's actually really cool and I was like yeah well I mean that's just like so far off like that's completely 180 yeah. like there's no way I can segue a dumb dumb girl like in, into that, like that's just start straight up starting over from scratch. But in my email to Jonathan, and the like, P.S. I was like, 
Or we could call it Kristen Control, like, I don't know. And he immediately wrote back, like, I love it. That was Kristen Control speaking with Arwen. And Arwen, we've heard from both Kristen and Jen now. Who was the one doing yoga during your interview? Because I would guess Jen, <laughs> since you're at home together, comfortable. No. Jen knows better than to try and get me to do yoga. But when we always, <laughs> so whenever we talk to people, we always ask them to like recommend something to us. And when Kristen was sitting here with me in the murder closet and I said, recommend something to me, she said, stretching. And then she, like, in this very elegant ballerina-esque way, moved her shoulders back. And I was like, ah, oh, I am such a troll. <laughs> and so I asked her for some help. And she was like, oh, yeah, this is just what you do. You just got to, like, get into child's pose. And she just got up off the stool and, like, walked a foot away and got into child's pose and showed me how to stretch. You would have to be graceful to do that in this room. There's really just only room to do yeah. child's pose. And just so you know, Kristen, I've been trying to stretch every day, and I think it's really making a difference. Oh, so thanks. Good recommendation. Jen is helping me, so maybe they're both stretchers. Wow. <laughs> this whole episode. I know, full circle. <laughs> okay, so who did we? Who else did we hear from today? What music did we hear? Today on the Sub Pop Podcast, you heard music from S. Slater Kinney, Dum Dum Girls, Kristen Control, and of course, Good Enough from Mud Honey. A de facto theme song. I love it. Thanks to Kristen Control and Jen Champion. You guys are really good sports. And yes. Thanks to Vern for your email. Oh, Vern. Be like Vern. We love you, Vern. <laughs> wow, it's great. <laughs> Vern. <laughs> um, Okay, find us at Sub Pop FM and on Twitter and Facebook, the Sub Pop Podcast. Yes, please, send, please send find us. <laughs> <laughs> so lonely in the murder closet. <laughs> it's lonely down here. And thanks to the Sub Pop Brass, Chris Jacobs, Megan Jasper, Jonathan Foneman. Thanks, guys. Way.